Let's talk USB 4.0, because hey, wasn't USB 3.2 just last week? Dix plays Seedwave digital photo frame review. Should you update your GPU or your monitor first? And quite a bit more, all coming up on Tech Thing. Patrons, we love you, because without your support, this wouldn't be happening. Patreon.com slash Tech Thing is the place to make the show happen. Please join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at Patreon.com slash Tech Thing. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Adam Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Which is why someone is terribly excited about something that is coming to a computer near you. Everyone freak out! No. No? No. No? Oh, no. okay. Well, I'm, I was freaking out a little bit. I was kind of excited about this. Well, okay, so... I am a content creator and speeds matter to me. So I was reading up on The Verge that apparently there is a new USB standard about to make its way to the market in like probably three years. Yay! <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm slightly joking around. This is not a reason to freak out, but this is actually a really good thing. So The Verge writes that the USB Implementers Forum, the USB IF, announced USB 4, which is the next version of USB. Mm -hmm. Yay! That's this new standard will eventually replace 3.2. Which should ship later this year. Yeah, which, <laughs> exactly. <coughs> and it will double the speed. And because I know this can get extremely confusing, I found a really pretty graph that we could show off. Yay. Yay. So yeah, so this does have like a nice fancy history of USB. So leave, <laughs> leave this up for a second. Okay, um, I, I'm ready. I, I feel like half of my adult life is right here. So unfortunately, <laughs> we were talking about this a bunch on, on uh, This Week in Computer Hardware last week. Uh, this image is not actually in compliance with the new naming convention <gasps> set down by the USB Implementers Forum last week regarding what? USB 3.2, AKA the uh, 2017 Next Gen USB spec we should see this year. Right. It's 2019, by the way, uh, <laughs> later this year. Um, so this one over here, the one all the way on the right, the USB 3.2, this is actually uh, USB 3.2 Gen 2 by 2, or for marketing purposes, there's a great document on this, uh, super speed USB 20 gigabits per second. And Aww. by the way, despite the fact that uh, they use super speed plus uh, in the documentation, in the specifications, these are not to be used in product names, messaging, packaging, or any other consumer-facing content. <laughs> so what we have is not USB 3.2, 20 gigabits per second, and it's not this thing down here, SuperSpeed++. Plus Plus. Right. It's uh, SuperSpeed USB 20 gigabits per second, AKA Gen 2 by 2 Which if this makes your head hurt, don't feel bad. Remember the whole Wi-Fi 654321 thing? Oh yes. Turns out that actually was fairly well thought out because when they do this whole USB 3.2 sweep, USB 3.1 Gen 1 becomes USB 3.2 5 gigabits per second and USB 3.1 Gen 2 becomes USB 3.2 10 gigabits per second. Okay. Clear as mud. Right, yes. It gives me great faith <laughs> that everything will be interoperable. Woohoo! Well, this, oh, poor Patrick. <laughs> it's okay, we'll be all right. Uh, this would be a very good time to point out that the 40, 40 gigabits per second USB 4 spec, we will probably see in products in like 2021. Yeah, it's, it's the royalty-free version of Thunderbolt 3 that Intel promised way back in 2017. That would be the Thunderbolt 3 that started shipping on products in 2015. <coughs> yeah, 2015. So our, our future is Apple's past, how, basically. How much did that hurt to say? <laughs> kind of. You know, I'm a big Android fan. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. So as The Verge writes, USB 4 will be able to deliver up to 100 watts of power. It has enough data throughput for the use of external graphics cards and to power two 4K displays or a single 5K display, which is awesome. Although most people are still using 1080p Full HD. Uh, you will need to use cables that are capable of 40 gigabits per second speeds to enjoy the standard's full benefits. We see the same information whenever we have any other new yeah. standard. You have to have the adapters and all the cables and everything else has to be friendly with it or else they will drop down to the previous speeds that they are available to them. And what really makes it weird is, is so the Intel Apple Thunderbolt thing is still Intel Apple certified yes. the USB 4.0, which is essentially Thunderbolt 3 
is going to be a little loose. Yeah, that's kind of fun. So while <laughs> the USB IF hopes that chip makers will use all of the new features of USB 4 as a standard, they're not going to have any kind of way of policing that. So that's probably not going to happen. So we will see subtle differences between manufacturers. So again, 2021 is probably when we will actually get to see it on the market. <laughs> but for content producers, this is going to be a really great time since USB speeds have slowly been getting faster and faster and this is wonderful for like video transfers. And the solid state devices that can actually use those speeds yep. are becoming more and more affordable. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's so beautiful. Like a flea on my dog. Oh, yes. <laughs> is that symbiotic? Oh, it's parasitic. Parasitic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know if you have any questions about USB 4 or if you want more clarification or information on uh, the best adapters and things out in the wilderness for USB, what do we call it now? The current generation? Three. USB 3.2, 5 gigabits per second, or USB 3.2, 10 gigabits per second. There we go. That's going <laughs> to make life so much easier. Ask at techthing.com, or you can tweet us at techthing. One port, though. One port? One port. Well, that's I'm the so best. I'm so excited about that. It's like, look, you Yay! get this. That. That one and only that one. Ah, <sighs> finally. It's going to be so simple. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We got an email from Jay. Hi, Jay. He says, I have an older AMD 260X 2 gig card and Apex Legends is not running it as high as I want. Oh, I oh that's the new game everybody's been talking about. I feel so old. I also have an older AOE 21.5 inch monitor and an LG 24 inch TV as a second monitor. Should I upgrade to a good four or eight gig card or a new 27 inch one or two millisecond monitor? Keep up the good work. I watch each week from Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. I mean, the first answer, of course, is well, both. Do all the things. A faster GPU and a bigger, more badass monitor. All the things. Um, all the things. <laughs> all the things. Buy everything. <laughs> Quote the economy. <laughs> um, serious answer, if the frame rates for your current uh, GPU or CPU are lagging, if you can't hit the frames per second you want, if it's not playable because, you know, you're like, upgrade your GPU first. Your 260X was sweet in 2014, but it is showing its age and throwing a higher resolution monitor at it or a monitor that runs at a higher refresh rate is going to be wasted on that old GPU because your old GPU is already having problems with your current monitor. The ever so awesome Gamers Nexus, uh, Steve Burke over Gamers Nexus, has this crazy article. Um, Apex Legends video card benchmark and best GPUs at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. He tested like a dozen GPUs. So if Whoa. you scroll down, this is a lot of benchmarking. Um, if you scroll Ooh. down to... Yay, beautiful graphs. Yeah, actually, they are beautiful. Whoa. So this is everything from an RTX 2080 Ti all the way down. See down here at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a GTX 970 SC. Okay. So that's a good, like, 50% faster, give or take, than that R7 260X. Wow. Well, okay. Maybe 35% faster. If you start looking at benchmarks, it's... So that 260X is, isn't even on there. Yeah, and the, <laughs> the, it's, it's, it's considered sort of like, well, 60 frames per second. Oh, um, okay. But that, that card is considerably faster than your GTX 970 SCJ, so I can totally see that your frame rates are probably hurting you. Um, a 6 gigabyte GTX 1060 will be a lot faster than your current card, but as we talked about last week, uh, if you're just doing 1080p gaming, a GTX 1660 Ti or an RTX 2060, uh, either one of those, you should be good to go for a few years of 1080 or 1440p gaming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of, you get so much more out of a 1660 Ti compared to a 1060. I just wanted to point out, like, if you can find a used 1060, it's going to be, well, where did it go? Okay, so this is probably generating... 50 or 60 percent. This 1060, this is probably like 50, 60 percent faster than your card. So you're looking wow. at an average of like 71 frames per second. And that's not bad. I don't think the 1660 Ti is on here yet, uh, but that's a 2060. That looks just like 112 frames per second. Ooh. That, of course, is at 1080p, not at, say, 4K. Mm -hmm. So, uh, A, I hope that helps. Uh, B, make sure your CPU has the capacity to feed the pixels to your GPU. And that Gamers Nexus article is an awesome read. I've got a link to it in the show notes. Maybe you've got a hardware question. 
email, askattackthing.com. We are curious and we want to make things run faster while using less energy and being more awesome. <laughs> That's why we pinstripe everything here. <laughs> We love your questions, your tips, your suggestions, your products and ideas to check out. You can tweet at TechThing at Snubs or at Patrick Norton because we kind of live on Twitter. Or you can email ask at TechThing.com because we kind of live in email too. And a big shout out to our patrons. Thank you, patrons. Patreon.com slash TechThing. You pay the bills. You make the show possible. Our thanks to you. Join the crew that makes TechThing happen at Patreon.com slash TechThing. Seriously, we appreciate it. Thanks. I'm really enjoying all the battle stations that people are sending in and their computer desks. They Keep are awesome. Keep sending them in to askatechthing.com. We put battle station or computer desk in the subject line. So we got one this week from Sam. We actually got a lot, but this yes. week I wanted to feature Sam's. We're, we're going to spread them out. Yes, we will. So as a pen tester who works from home mostly, he says, I utilize a pair of ultra wide monitors on an Ikea desk, soon to be upgrading it with some electric legs to convert it into a standing desk. Huge fan of the show. Keep up the great work from Sam in the UK. Thanks, Sam. And he supplied us with this gorgeous photo. Also, I love your lamps. They look kind of like Edison bulbs and they are so cool. I really like the minimalism. It's totally my thing. It's very zen. It is very zen. I feel soothed. I do too. <laughs> and he's running Cali. That's so cool. Oh my goodness. Props, props for running Cali. Thank you, Sam. Love it, yes. So send over your battle station picks. We love them. They're super fun and we will continue to feature them in the show as a new reoccurring segment thing for y'all. <laughs> They're super fun, yay. <laughs> uh, we also have something super fun this week as well. That is not a battle station. The search for a better, more awesome, ever so delightful, charming, and friendly to the magnificent photographage that comes out of her incredibly <laughs> awesome oh. Sony A7 super badass camera oh. thing. I, well, I'm joking, right? I love right, your introductions. They're I'm, so cool. I'm, I'm <laughs> being weird. Also, there was a really long URL that I was trying to cover while the script scrolled forward. You actually really like you, you looked at one of these last year. I did, yeah. I reviewed uh, one of Nick's plays original photo frames mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and this year, I ran into them at CES. Since I loved the original one, I thought it was really nice. I had to check out the newest generation of products. And that includes this one, which I am holding right here. Let's see if it'll switch. Oh, look how fast that was. Let's see a switch back. Oh, look how fast that was. <laughs> so fun. So this one is called the Nixplay Seed Wave. It's the 13 inch widescreen Wi-Fi, also Bluetooth edition of their smart photo frame. And the weird thing about this is it also has speakers in the back. In the back. It also has speakers. One and two. It's like a bow tie. <laughs> it's, it does kind of look like a bow but tie. That's a really good comparison, <laughs> yeah. So as a reminder, the Iris photo frame, that's the one I reviewed previously, that had a 1024 by 768 display. Mm -hmm. It connected to your phone via an application, allows you and your family and friends to upload photos via their app and their cloud platform to your frame or to your family's frames. <laughs> Remember kids, don't confuse Snapchat yeah. and the frame at grandma's house. Yes, <laughs> make sure you know what you're sending to grandma. Uh, I actually gave my mom one for Christmas and I send her pictures whenever I travel and my sister sends her pictures whenever nice. of, of the new niece. Which is exactly, it's cool. It's totally cool and she loves it. She's like, oh, I saw the new picture when I got home from work. I'm like, oh yeah, you mom. So it has a sensor built in for light and mo motion changes. Mm -hmm. You can connect it to Google Photos library where I could easily sync my photos to the frame through albums. That one was $179.99 and it is still available online so you can find that over at mm -hmm. Amazon. I'll put that link in the show notes below of course. Now the Seed Wave, that's this new one, this is an upgraded model that includes a 1920 by 1080 resolution IPS screen. So it's a little bit of an upgrade for the screen. It connects via the same application, uses the exact same techniques to transition Good. between photos. So you have all those options as, as you did similarly. Uh, similar sensors as well, there's two of them down here for motion. 
Uh, it also connects to the same applications like Google Photos and Amazon's mm -hmm. Assistant, so you can voice activate it. But it also packs in a Bluetooth speaker, and that's what you saw on the back, for $249.99. So it's a little over 200 bucks on this one. So the screen itself, I thought was gorgeous. It's very crisp, it's very clear. I don't have it at full brightness right now so that it doesn't blow out the cameras up here so you can see it in our studio. It pops with color, works flawlessly, especially like I, I showed you, switching between landscape to portrait mode. So that looks Sorry. great. You have your Muppet, excited Muppet face on by oh, the, yes. the telescope. Telescopes, <laughs> uh, that was a really, really fun day. Uh, so yeah, it looks great. Uh, this one also uses its power plug as the stand so you can convert this to either portrait or the other mode. Uh, it does not have any mounting brackets as you can see for the wall, so it's only for a flat surface. Now, since the Seed Wave is their largest display yet, as you will notice, it is pretty big here. It also includes a rubber stand, and that rubber stand is right here. And you can use this in both portrait and la landscape mode. Is that I to love keep that it you're, sliding you're looking forward? at it like, what in the world? Yeah. It's traction. So, this doesn't have like a very traction y Got it. bottom to it. It's a little bit slippery because it's very smooth. So, they include this little rubber thing right. under there because it is a little bit more heavy, too, to, just to make sure that it's not going to you know, fall down on your or anything okay. like that. I didn't have any issues with it falling down, so the rubber stand definitely works. So, yay, <laughs> rubber stand. Keeps it sturdy and rigid. That's great. The app is mainly intuitive, and when I made changes in the app, they automatically updated on my frame. Of course, I did have the app and this on the same Wi-Fi connection. You might notice a little bit of a delay if you're on a different connection, right. or if you're like international while your mom's at home with her photo frame. That will cause a bit of a delay before she actually receives it because it has to go up to the server. Because physics. Yes. Yay. <laughs> Digital times. Woohoo. Now, I did notice one thing uh, when I was adding photos to my display that I have a feature request, though, for next play. So I hope you're listening, guys. Uh, if you go into your library of photos in your phone's photo app and you start choosing photos for next play, the next step is to upload to an album in the next next play app. But if you have not already created an album for your new photo, and you don't want to add them to an existing photo album, then you have no choice but to back out, create an album first, and then choose your photos for the album. Thereby, you lose all your original choices from your library. Uh. So, like, for example, I was adding, I was collecting all these pictures from New Zealand, and then I was like, oh, I don't want to put these in my Germany album. I, and then I had to escape back and then create a new New Zealand album and then stick all my pictures in there. And I was just like, that's that's kind of and unintuitive. And you had to go back and find all the pictures over Yeah, there. I had to go back and find all the same ones. And I was just like, well, that's a waste of time. So that little thing right there is unintuitive. A small annoyance, but nothing major. Hopefully they can just change that and add that option in. Uh, videos at 15 seconds or less can also be played back on the screen, but that's only available on iOS right now, so I'm not able to test that feature. So it's like Periscope for iOS users yeah. of the next play. Yeah, like um, tick TikTok, that's what the kids are using these days, and Snapchats and stuff like like those well, short format it, videos. You could stick those on here. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Those would work, yeah, but only if you have iOS. So I have an Android device. I wasn't able to test that. Uh, the other big feature of this frame is that it has the Bluetooth 4.0 speakers on the back. Had no problem connecting on my phone, staying connected when I walked to the other end of my decently sized apartment. Uh, the speakers are loud, very loud, and they are clear. They have relatively no bass, though, even though a bass and audio amplifier are built in. They are two five watt speakers so they do justice to mids and highs like with podcasts right. i was listening to daily tech news show and it sounded excellent uh, vocal music is another example that sounded beautifully clear but my really heavy bass music was right. really lackluster and i was kind of kind of sad it's about hard that. to get bass out of an enclosure that has no volume yeah yeah exactly so does that bluetooth speaker play the 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 audio from the 15 second videos or is it just like hey we have a space to put a bluetooth speaker on here so we put a bluetooth speaker on here it's a great question and i wish i knew <gasps> But I couldn't check the videos. Terribly yeah, I couldn't sorry. try. I couldn't try the videos. Uh, but it does play Bluetooth music just fine while it's playing the, mm -hmm. you know, the slideshow of pictures on the front. Okay. That does add a little bit of a feature to it. It's pretty cool. Ambiance. 
It is kind of nice though to like listen to a podcast while I'm getting ready in the morning and then see my picture showing up on this frame in the background and I'm just like, oh, I'm reminded on my cool vacation that I took. So that's kind of neat. Now, of course, if you don't need a speaker, Nextplay also has the new Seed 10 inch and 8 inch frames, which are under $200 each. Oh, cool. Those might be worth looking into if you are interested because Unless you want a speaker on the back of your photo frame, you don't really need to spend an extra $50 for that. Part of me is like there's so many speakers in my house which are already yeah, yeah, connected that's the to thing. apps that's on my thing. phone. So the idea of being like, oh, I'm going to be in the living room. Right, near exactly. The photo frame. So other than the lacking base, uh, I really love the updated screen. It looks gorgeous. The bigger form factor is also awesome. And the continuation of their other features that you already get with Nixplay mm -hmm. is awesome. I'm glad they haven't changed very much with those features since the last one that I reviewed. Uh, but they do listen to feature requests. So hopefully they can change that one bug that I noticed in the application. And other than that, yeah, great photo frame. Definitely worth taking a look at. Android app for the videos. Yes. <laughs> we got an interesting tweet from Syed. Now, we know USB bad USB-C cables are really, really bad for your yes. phones and your laptops. And he's got a question for us. Is it better to get a branded USB-C adapter or some generic Chinese USB-C adapter can work too without harming my devices connected to it? I'm talking about the USB-C adapters which come with USB ports, HDMI, LAN, and card readers. Mm. So I, I gotta say, first up, I am so much less worried about USB-C docks that convert a USB-C port into a bunch of stuff like yeah. a monitor output, an ethernet jack, uh, than I am about uh, anything that, that runs power into uh, USB-C USB power into your devices. I mean, think about it, Shannon's got close to a grand into that Pixel 3. Mm -hmm. um, I have USB-C power on this Lenovo laptop I'm using right now, that's like $2,000 worth of laptop. I do not want to fry these or light my house on fire to yep. save money. Yep. <laughs> so uh, that said, my biggest problem with USB-C uh, Thunderbolt docks, even from well-known manufacturers, is that they often don't work very well. And if you're mm. trying to figure out what I'm talking about, uh, I mean something like the Dell's uh, Dell's Business Thunderbolt Dock TB16 with a 180 watt uh, adapter, yes. which by the way works really, really well. And if you've never used one, uh, <laughs> one cable goes into your laptop and everything else is taken care of by this box. And it's a really nice way to turn a laptop into a complete desktop kind of office situation. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is I tested a bunch of these from fairly high profile manufacturers uh, and you know, the Dell one, it worked. But if you go to Dell's website and look at the reviews, because people connect so many different things to them, the success rate is like, it's like. It's all over the place. Yeah, it's like an average yeah. of 3.2 because it's all five star and one star reviews. Yeah. It did all my things. This didn't work and it sucks. It did all my things. This didn't work and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So your mileage is gonna vary a lot uh, based on depending on what you're connecting to it. And as you get farther from taking a high profile manufacturer with their high profile laptop and you get into like, hi, I'm Bob, I've been making computer products for 30 years and now I've got a USB-C dock. <laughs> you certainly do, Bob, and what a fine paperweight it made. Um, <laughs> it, it, and also, Linux. Yeah. One of the foulest strings of epitaphs I have ever heard in my adult life, which is saying something, uh, came out from a friend of ours who, who had a very, very expensive laptop and bought a very, very expensive dock and discovered that there was almost no Linux support for yep. the dock. We anticipate drivers for Linux will eventually be released after we finish releasing the drivers we haven't released for the Windows Customers that are the majority of the people buying the product. <laughs> it's so true. Linux always gets like the um, short end of the stick. You know, and, and these, I, just if you buy a USB-C dock or a Thunderbolt dock, buy it from someplace with a, a gracious and generous return policy. Yes. Because it may be the best thing ever, or you may spend like three days re manually reloading drivers and figuring out what order to connect things into to get the things to thing, and then... <laughs> I'm less worried about where it comes from, Syed, than if it actually works at all. And if you're running power, especially power for a fat laptop through it, I would be very conservative about where I got my dock from. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hack5, for the studio space. Check out the Security and Privacy Podcast over at hack5.org. Look at those shiny, happy people there. Then head over to Hack5 Products. And by the way, I am so excited because, you know, this is the ducky, which we love, and bash bunnies are really kind of scary. 
we have something new. The plunder bug. The plunder bug package nipping has never been easier. It's a land tap. It's a smart land tap. What is a smart land tap? <laughs> well, you can connect to it from all your things, including your phone. Uh, and it's a remote pen testing tool that allows you to connect um, via a LAN port, uh, via USB-C as well. So lots That's of cool. upgraded features, really, really cool. USB-C, passive recording or active scanning and an Android root app. I yep. am excited, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to bring one home though, because <laughs> only strange and wonderful things could happen if I do that. Right, right. <laughs> Plus I have a 3D printer to finish getting running, but I'll talk about that next week. Mm, that'll be fun. <laughs> that'll be a fun review. And remember, once in a while, put down your phone. Step away from your screen. Close your laptop. <sighs> ah, I know, right? It's so zen. And do something analog, like Scott, who Scott. wrote, I have a really nice analog picture for y'all from my last Japan trip. This is from the Hama Rikyu Garden in Chuo, Tokyo. Oh. It's beautiful. It was a super rainy day and a wonderful place to walk through. Just wish I had remembered my umbrella or a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. Looks like you went in the fall. What a good time to go to Japan. It looks gorgeous in the fall. Is there ever a bad time to go to Japan? Nope, no. I mean, in summer it gets really hot, but it's still gorgeous. It's like so. Las Vegas hot? Uh, no, not that bad. Okay. <laughs> but humid, definitely humid though. Yeah. I'm sure there's some amazing collection of foods that have evolved over the last thousand years to make hot weather more tolerable in Japan. Oh yes, like, like ice cream. Sweet tea in the south. Yep. <laughs> I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. <laughs> we'll see you next week on Tech Thing. I went in May, in May in 2016, and, and their purple ice cream, I think it was purple potato ice cream or something like that, was so good. Purple potato ice cream. I'm just like, no, I'm So good. Somebody was like, what flavor is the red one? And my friend was like, red. And they're like, no, 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 what is it? Like, no, it tastes like red. It <laughs> does, it tastes like red. But purple, <laughs> purple potato, ice, purple potato ice cream? Yeah, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of it. Um, I tried it over at one of the temples or one of the shrines. Yeah, vegan purple sweet potato ice cream. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's it's so good. It, it's it so was pretty. really, it's very pretty. Uh, it's called ube, ube, purple sweet potato ice cream. Yeah, I was gonna call it ume, and then I was like, that's not the right so word. So there are at least three purple foods in nature: purple potatoes, yep. purple sweet potatoes, and ice cream made from one of the former. Yay, ice cream! <laughs>